All right. Good evening, everyone. Everyone, thank you for being here. Really happy we're able to join us. Go ahead and get started. Also, want to welcome our guests for joining us on the live. So, thank you. Um, I'd like to take this moment to acknowledge that we're gathered here this evening on the ancestral lands of the Miami, Potawatomi, Shawnee, and Lenape and other native peoples of the past and present. We also acknowledge that IUPUI displaced the African-American business and residential neighborhoods of Indiana Avenue and Ransom Place in the 1960s. We honor those who have cared for this place in the past, and we hope sincerely that its current use for the pursuit and sharing of knowledge and understanding, which are goals of the university, will lead to a future that is more equitable and just. Before we begin, I would also like to, uh, before we begin the panel discussion, I would also like to recognize two patrons of this evening's event. Um, complimentary parking is made possible by the great frame up of Indianapolis and Carmel. We thank them for the continued support, underwriting parking for our guests. Um, if you're parked in the parking garage, you can pick up a parking validation code from the gallery staff at any time this evening. I also want to thank and recognize Heron's hospitality sponsor, Hotel Indy for providing housing accommodations for Heron's visiting artists and scholars. Hotel India is located in downtown Indianapolis. In addition to this evening's panel discussion, we're also hosting a reception celebrating the opening of three exhibitions in our galleries here in the building. The exhibition associated with this evening's talk, the Museum of Broken Relationships, is presented in the Berkshire, Reese, and Paul Gallery, which is just outside the auditorium. Down the hall in the Marsh Gallery, we have an exhibition by students in our junior painting program called Blended Color. I also want to share that immediately following the artist panel discussion, guests are invited to gather near the Basile Gallery, near our library, as we honor the late Ian Frazier, who helped establish Heron's study abroad program in 1979. Ian passed away in December at the age of 93, and we've been missed by so many. The current exhibition in that space in the Basile Gallery titled Away features work by current and past students who participated in recent study abroad programs to Italy and Southeast Asia. That exhibition is dedicated in honor of Ian. So please join us if you're able. Okay, these exhibitions will also soon be available through visual tours, which um, these are virtual tours, which will be accessible on Heron's website and made possible by support from an anonymous donor. Um, also, to help introduce this evening's panel discussion and the participants, I'm very pleased to welcome and introduce my friends and colleague and the Dean of the School of Liberal Arts. So please help me welcome Dean Tammy Idle. Thank you so much, Greg. I appreciate it. And I'm very excited to be here. We are really delighted to have the artists and the Museum of Broken Relationship Founders here with us tonight. Um, it's, it's great that they could join us. The museum, as all of you know, is based in Zagreb, Croatia, and has organized exhibitions in communities worldwide, which is, is really exciting to have them here in Indianapolis with us. Over the past several months, there's a lot of work that's been going on. And I know professors Lois Silverman and Laura Holzman um, have led IUPUI students in collaboration around the Museum of Broken Relationships. During the fall semester, Museum Studies and Heron students contributed to developing the exhibition at Heron Galleries, creating a fantastic array of public programs and resources that will um, be seen throughout Indy um, during the semester, and by curating smaller satellite displays that will be, be on view around Indianapolis. So I hope that you'll you know, be able to visit some of those as well over the next several months. Um, the museum studies students who are, are doing all of this as part of their studies um, will be evaluating how this event unfolds. And so they're gonna have the experience of looking back at, at how this impacted all of us, which will be really um, fantastic. So I just want to congratulate and thank those students um,
and their community partners who have helped to make the Museum of Broken Relationships um, Indianapolis a reality. I'm looking to see if we have our guest. I don't think our next guest is here, so I will turn it back to Laura. I think. Thank you so much, Tammy and Greg, for those introductions. Um, we are now going to begin the conversation portion of this evening. To get situated here. Um, and to be with all of you this evening, everyone who's joined us here on campus and everyone who's called in through Zoom. I guess I should look at this camera point to all of you listening, wherever else you are. Um, and it's really a special pleasure to be here in person, in conversation, um, um, Drajan Grubisic and Olinka Vistitsa from the Museum of Broken Relationships, and my lovely colleague, Lois Silverman from the Museum Studies Program. Um, we are going to have a conversation. Lois and I will talk with Drajan and Alinka for a little bit, and then we'll open up the floor for questions from all of you. If you're listening on Zoom, please use the Q&A um, tool to share your questions. That's why I've got my computer here, so I'll be able to bring your questions into the conversation as well. So, Drajan and Alinka. <laughs> Thank you, Laura, for these great words. So we are so honored to be here and thankful to all the students who have worked on this project and, of course, uh, your wonderful teachers and professors who happen to be our friends. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Lois, for making this project possible. It's been an adventure and it's really a great pleasure to see it now on inherent galleries and also satellite displays around Indianapolis. Thank you. Thank you. The, I really think the pleasure was ours. So we'll let everybody in on the on the story of how this all how this all happened. So we know that there are a lot of people here tonight who are familiar with the Museum of Broken Relationships, but there are probably just as many people here who maybe are learning about the project for the first time. So how do you like to introduce the Museum of Broken Relationships to people? Oh, that's a hard, hard one. Still a hard one because the museum keeps changing all, all over, over these years. So Museum of Broken Relationships um, is a, an archive. Uh, it's a collection of confessional prose. It's a collection of objects. Uh, from people like you and me all over the world uh, who have uh, donated their intimate possessions and stories to the to this global initiative uh, in order to uh, share their stories of love, loss, and growth. Um, it's been so museum has become so many things so there is a real museum uh brick and mortar museum in zagreb i never thought it would uh it would happen but it did uh we've had 62 traveling exhibitions around the world so which is also amazing and i think more than 4000 people have participated in in this project so i would say it's um it's um work in progress it doesn't seem to stop so <laughs> and we are just following it so it's like a global um i don't know initiative a flower that keeps growing so maybe that's the way to kind of describe what it is today <laughs> i love that um if it is a flower that keeps growing what is the seed <laughs> that became the flower <laughs> Uh, well, um, so the Museum of Broken Relationships was, um, it was a break 
upfueled brainchild of Russian Grubishits and myself. Um, so many years ago, I think uh, more than 20 years ago, we were a couple uh, working in arts both. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really bad at years and dates and, uh, you know, I can't really place things in the in the past. Uh, but it was long ago. Uh, and um, during um, those conversations, we we all know at some point in our lives uh, when you want to, you know, go a different way, uh, try something else. Uh, we, we were lucky because it was uh, quite a garden variety split. There were no really, you know... <laughs> um uh, really bad moments but it was sad and uh we spent a lot of time talking about you know all the beautiful moments we shared together and how it's so sad that the relationship that kind of filled us with um excitement and enthusiasm and so many things that we've lived together that we have to say goodbye and forget all about it and um, we were surrounded by so many objects that were not just objects, but they were like silent witnesses of many wonderful and bad things we have lived together. And then we started to question ourselves, maybe these objects in a way keep the memory alive because you just look at them and it triggers your memory instantly. And then, um, I don't know, I think this name, Museum of Broken Relationships, just came instantly to, to our minds as something that could be an archive of relationships past, relationships that no longer have the right to live in the present. So like a shelter for exiled loves, uh, this is something we, we, we like to call it. And... Um, we just imagine that space museum that keeps keepsakes of past relationships alive and wrote an essay about that imaginary utopian space that did not exist uh, without any thought whatsoever that, you know, we could really do it one day. <laughs> and uh, Two years after we started to live uh, in different places, I think Drajan called me and said, you know, there is this art show. Uh, it's a biannual big exhibition in Zagreb and there is a call for project. So what do you think uh, it would be maybe uh, a good idea? Yeah, a good idea to apply with this um, concept and for me it was like whoa like an arts project <laughs> never thought about that and then we sent just that text and uh, we got accepted and we were given just two weeks to uh, do uh, the installation it was uh, imagined as an arts installation and they said we don't have a gallery space for you but there is a garden so in two weeks we had to talk to friends, talk to people and see if they were hooked <laughs> on the idea because it worked for us, but we didn't know whether it would work for other people. Uh, and that was great. They were all kind of, oh, I might have a, something for you. This is such a great idea. And in no time we were meeting also like complete strangers. You know, you have these meeting points in town under the clock and... And these were really wild, uh, interesting days because I couldn't believe that people would be willing to, you know, hand you a part of their intimacy. But that happened. And um, we uh, found a sponsor who brought a ship container, <laughs> a big ship container that was uh, put with a crane in the in the garden of the of the gallery. And that was like the shelter for the first 40 objects we collected in Zagreb at at that time. This is, I, I don't know, maybe this is too long a story, but this is how it started. <laughs> I, it's, it's a great story. Yeah, yeah. Lois. Thanks so much. So that story 
happened, if I'm correct, in the year 2006. Yeah. Which was 17 years ago. Okay. <laughs> and you know your math. <laughs> you know I don't. <laughs> Okay, so with that in mind, you mentioned earlier that since that time and that first exhibition in the shipping container, you have established a brick and mortar museum in Zagreb, Croatia, that if you go to TripAdvisor, I believe it's the most highly ranked, either number one or number two of the most visited uh, tourist site, number one <laughs> in Zagreb. And um, you've had exhibitions in more than 30 countries. So Indianapolis, we are very lucky to join these esteemed ranks. We're thrilled that you have brought Museum of Broken Relationships to the Circle City. So it's been quite a journey. And I would love to hear both of you, either of you speak about how has MBR evolved along this way? What has stayed constant? What has changed? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can start and then you can chime in. Um, well, it's um, it has been, how to say, like an organic journey. Many things were not planned. So it started with this um, installation. And at the time we thought it's gonna be one time project. But uh, as the international press picked up the story, it was kind of all over the place. And for us, you know, coming from a small country like Croatia, it was kind of a surprise that it worked so well and that people were um, interested. So we started to stage that project in other places, but the 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 core, the heart of the project was still the same. You know, we were approaching people with a simple question. Uh, have you ever had a broken heart? And would you like to share your story with uh, kindred human beings, someone you don't know in a, in a, in a safe and uh, dignified uh, space where you would be in company with similar stories? So... I think that idea of transforming something which is your own uh, solitude maybe and pain into something which is a public project, you, you become of, your story becomes part of something bigger um, um, and you feel this connection to other, uh, other people through the emotion that is common to all of us, no matter from which country or, um, I don't know, which language we speak, uh, gods we believe in, this, this worked well everywhere, so everyone could connect. And this um, uh, respect and um, may, like, excitement and enthusiasm about human stories, I think this has stayed the same. And uh, even though 20 years have passed, this is what we uh, tell to each other very often, you know, oh, is this kind of becoming boring or you don't know whether people would like it or not, but the moment you step into the, the process again and you get to know the people, the stories, there is always something that surprises you and that kind of makes you think, okay, it's worth it, let's let's continue. There's no other choice. Um, what has changed? So the aspect of the project, so it was, it was meant to be an arts installation, uh, but somehow the name we have given to the project Museum of Broken Relationships kind of um, uh, made it interesting for the museum community, although that was never our, you know, planned goal. I just, we just like the name of the museum as something that is uh, keeping, preserving, but also sharing the, the heritage of the humankind. 
And um, so we've been like welcomed into the museum community, which was also, I al always felt like an elephant in a, <laughs> in a room. Uh, but through that process, we've learned a lot uh, also from colleagues and through that exchange with different institutions. We've worked with museums, galleries, universities. Uh, we have staged the project in post offices, shopping malls. So, so that the, the kind of the, the let's say the attire <laughs> the museum took on was changing and uh, maybe the, the setup was changing uh, uh, with respect to the culture we were in. So the objects were changing and also the stories became more and more varied, uh, like romantic splits and breakups, a lot of uh, family related stories, uh, relationships, parents and kids. Uh, relationships to oneself and uh, uh, like refugee stories, like forced breakups with the with the country and the culture, and a lot of um, uh, a lot of let's say big events, uh, unfortunate events of our time, wars, social conditions came to be an important part of these stories so i can tell now that after after uh, 17 years uh, museum of broken relationships is also a reflection of our times and we can see how the stories have been changing um through through these two decades <laughs> almost thank you <laughs> so um we are at the art school so let's talk a little bit about your creative practice when i think about the museum of broken relationships i start to situate it in that whole cross-section of cultural production that blurs the boundaries between making art and making exhibitions I also think about the histories of artists making meaning through juxtaposition and assemblage, and also by collaborating with people who aren't professional artists. But I am wondering how you would describe your, your creative practice. What's your medium and your method? Simply put, this would be a piece of conceptual art but that's very simply put. Uh, uh, being able to, actually doing a project that is crowdsourced is really challenging because there is no control whatsoever of what you are going to get. So we're left in the open. And th that was my first fear when we started that it will be incredibly boring and repetitive. Luckily, this first 40 objects that we got were amazing. We got the prosthetic leg from a war veteran to the keys to bottles to crazy stories. And it continued like this for the last 17 years. Um, the creative process in, in my head, what is creative about this uh, is what you said, assemblage. That would be, yeah, the, the, the because each object and story, they are not art in any way. But combining them together and creating this roller coaster of emotion for a visitor, that for me is art. And, and being able to connect visitors in, on an emotional level to the stories and make them think about themselves, about their friends, their family, because something reminded them, something was there to poke them. Uh, for me, this is the biggest thing you can achieve in, in an art project. So I think in, in that way, uh, just you know, when I sit in my cafe and I come, people come from visiting museum and they sit down and you hear them 
in these debates and discussions and mono dialogues where you know everything comes out. And I'm sure that next morning when they wake up, they will still have it in their head. And this, that's it. You you can't ask for more. So yeah, it's it's it was it it's like nowhere. It's in between everything. Uh, we're not museum professionals. Uh, we kind of stumbled upon it, but in a way that gave us an advantage because we were quite open-minded to it. Uh, we're big museum fans, so we kind of pick 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 and choose. You know, we we took what we thought was great and uh, kind of mixed it up together. Yeah, I've been thinking as we've been working together over the past several months about, of course, the process of gathering objects and stories and the crowdsourcing element, and then the process of figuring out how do we put these stories in conversation with each other and these objects in conversation with each other in meaningful ways. But one of the things I was really struck by in our conversations was hearing both of you talk about creating this emotional arc or this emotional experience for the visitor. And I started to think about like sculpting emotion or sculpting with emotion. And I just wondered, like, what do you think about that? I think every great piece of art is doing exactly that. Uh, when you look at the, you know, Guernica or when you look at, when you walk in, in Rome in, in the, in Vatican, when you walk in and you see the church, the layout, and some of the sculptures, it's it's emotion. It's a, it's on an emotional level. So yeah, every every great piece of art is is sculpting your emotion in a way. Um, maybe yeah, I'm, I I don't know. It's sure. <laughs> too complicated. <laughs> it's too complicated. <laughs> um, I'm going to be a little bit unconventional, Lois. You specialize in museums and well-being and social work. <laughs> and so I am wondering from your perspective, what do you see as the power of this project? And maybe how does emotion play into that? Thank you, Laura. So I want to take this moment to just say, um, my own origin story of connecting with these amazing creators. And that is that when I was doing research on interesting museum projects around the world and the potential of museums to contribute to the well being of relationships and to address social issues in our society. Um, and that came together in a research project and a book that I wrote, The Social Work of Museums. Little did I know that reaching out to some amazing projects around the world would yield me some incredible friends 20 years later and counting, um, or less than that. But so what struck me then and has only continued the more that I have had the pleasure of working with you both and seeing the Museum of Broken Relationships in action um, is that from my perspective, the project has the potential for both healing and connection, two things that are just fundamental to our lives, individual healing. So the act of being able to have a place that's out of the ordinary, it's not the therapist's office, it's a creative place. You feel like you're part of something and the museum in a way bears witness to your story. The fact that it's anonymous is part of what makes it safe and meaningful for us. So I believe that it has great healing potential for individuals who choose to contribute. And the other side of the coin is the potential for connection in all different ways, connecting you with the person that you're visiting with connecting you with a stranger, perhaps as you're looking at the, at the displays together and connecting you with someone or someone's in other countries all over the world with whom you are sharing a similar story and experience. So I think there's even more amazing potential, but to me, healing and connection are, are just quite profound through the project. 
Thanks for asking. <laughs> okay, so um, ever since I met you guys, you have defined yourselves first as artists. And even in our conversation so far, both of you have taken time to say you are not museum professionals. Okay, although you love museums and you've been willingly or not, you've been drawn into the museum community. And I want to specifically say um, we were actually together in Houston. And okay, I'm trying to keep my numbers straight. It was in 2011, the American Alliance of Museums Conference, where you guys brought the Museum of Broken Relationships to the museum community. We had a presentation and it was during that time, those days that we were in the conference together in Houston, where you learned that you had been awarded the Kenneth Hudson Award for the most innovative museum in Europe. And I wanna quote, who gets this award, okay? This award quote goes to the museum person or group that demonstrates the most unusual daring or controversial achievement that challenges common perceptions of the role of museums in society. They want it. They're not museum people, or so they say. So I would love for you to talk some about any ways that, and I don't want you to be modest, okay? This is two part question. Number one, in what ways have you actually witnessed that your project 17 years and running has had an impact on the museum field? And then I'll remind you, the second question is, in what ways would you like your work to have an impact on the museum profession? <clears throat> so when I, we were playing around with this, these conversations and when I said, I asked Rajan the first part and he said, well, I think we've already had some impact. So tell us about that. Yeah, well, um, we see around us that museums pop up uh, with similar attitude of collecting objects and collecting stories connected to uh, memory in a way, different, different fields, so to say. Um, but yeah, maybe the, the, to, to go back to, I remember when I went to Paris uh, in a museum, they had Napoleon's letters to Josephine. And so everyone knows about this romance and, and what it meant. And so you're trying to connect to that somehow. And they're in a glass vitrine on a, red plush and they look nice, but you can't actually read them because of the handwriting. Uh, it's not transcribed. And there's actually no way you can connect to this on, on any kind of emotional level. Um, I'm sure there, there are ways for museums to do this. I always feel like museums are afraid that, that people don't like to read. I think we have proven that, yeah, People can read, they can spend an hour in a museum and they can go and read all hundred stories. And that is something like that museums are running away from. And I'm sure that every piece, you, it's like you had, everyone has this favorite high school teacher that somebody was math, somebody was geography, somebody, but every field, can be presented in a really interesting way if you have a really good teacher. So this is like with the museum, you could, you could tell a story, you could make it really interesting, no matter what you're exhibiting, what kind of art it is. So maybe just this, and then, uh, yeah, this, this uh, emotional connection. I mean, it's easy for us because we're dealing with something that is so universal. Um, uh, you can find themes that are universal and, and work on it, uh, if that would be part of the answer. You want to add something? I can try. So, <laughs> yeah, I think that what we've um, 
what we've brought to the museum world is kind of, I think, the the uh, concept of love and empathy came through the big door onto the scene. And I think this is something that um, we often forget that it's uh, not just a feeling and emotion that uh, love and empathy is also uh, a way of learning about the world. And I think that sometimes we put too much accent on the information and loads of information, forgetting that what Drajan says, connecting on the emotional level is, um, um, is something where you can learn also what it means to be human. <laughs> and uh, this is something I think that the museum has brought to, to, to the museum scene, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Did you want to mention any of those um, museums that you were talking about yesterday? Were you saying no? No? OK. <laughs> you can. <laughs> Okay. Well, then I'm going to go to Laura. Can. I want to ask you a question. So um, you have a shorter history with MBR, but you have had an incredible sprint over this year with the major exhibition in the galleries that we're going to see and the satellite displays. And I'm just curious your perspective on how their work can impact the museum profession. And here we are training museum professionals for the next generation. So what do you see as the potential? I'm, I might get in trouble for my answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think from the perspective of somebody who, who teaches museum studies students, we're always thinking, of course, about how to expose our students to interesting and innovative things that are happening in museums here and, and around the world. And we are also helping them learn whatever is considered to be best practices at the time. Um, we read the scholarship with our students. We talk to people who are doing this work you know, on the ground. And, um, and then we try to help our students understand why it's really a good idea to do something the way that it's spelled out in this article or this book chapter or this professional association presentation or something like that. But one of the things I've really been reminded of by working on this project is that just because something is a best practice for the broader museum field doesn't mean that it's always the right way to do it. And I really, really value the way that working with you has helped me reconnect with some more flexibility in my own practice, whether it's my own curatorial work or the way that I talk with my students about various approaches museums can take. And I think that that is extremely valuable because I know that it's really easy for, um, for students and, and, and active museum professionals at the top of their game to go into an exhibition context. And like, we turn on our, like we can't turn off the professional brain and we start to think like, oh, I wish this thing were this way or if I had done it this way, it would, it would be different. But I also think like there is a huge value in just taking a breath and really appreciating the artistry in an exhibition practice and an exhibition process, even and maybe actually especially when some of those things don't necessarily look like what a lot of people are saying museums might, you know, should be should be doing. And I I really, I really appreciate that aspect of what the Museum of Broken Relationships has to offer. And just to give one example of that, um, I think I I would challenge anybody to go through the exhibit and not have some some moment of deep and meaningful 
connection with an object, with themselves, with a memory of something, with the person there. I don't know what it's going to be for each person, but I really think it's going to happen. And that happens by, like what Rajan said, by reading and by looking at stuff. And it's really nice to have the reminder that the simple act of looking and reading can be an incredibly engaging and absorbing experience. And I think it's important that um, in the museums, at the exhibitions, that we've maybe forgotten that uh, we can give ourselves time to contemplate and uh, meditate and learn and we don't have to rush. <laughs> and I think museums are rare places where that is allowed, you know, that in our busy lives, there's always a new project, a new event you have to be, you have to uh, be productive and always smiling. There is no time for, you know, taking a break. So I think uh, museums here have a huge potential for connecting people. And um, I think that um, we are bombarded by so much content, you know, today through social media, I don't know, Netflix. And, and what I miss is someone who would curate that for me and say, maybe this could be interesting or that could be interesting. So you could find your way in that uh, mountain of content and I think the museums have exactly that that someone has thought about a subject and someone can think how uh, how uh, they can present that content to you especially you and that you feel involved that and I think this is something that we truly need uh, in those times to to have access to that true knowledge uh, not just information. I don't know. Appropriate. So I I would like to maybe shift gears just a little bit, but may, actually, it's I think it's building on some of what you've said. Um, I've heard you mention that each traveling Museum of Broken Relationships exhibit takes on a different inflection partly because the show comes together in direct response to the donations of the people in the place where it, it exists. So I'm wondering, what, what do you find to be unique about the Indianapolis show? Um, well, there has been so unique to... Uh, we had the break of almost two years because of the COVID and uh, we, okay, we had two exhibitions during COVID, but we didn't go. We just, you know, set the track go and um, so this, we had Mexico City and this is the second after these two years of pause and it seems like the world has changed. Um, the stories are much heavier in a way. So is it just Indianapolis? We will see, you know, this year and next year, has everything changed? But there used, used to be like half, half, so to say, light, funny, uh, uplifting, and a bit more sad. But this, this has become quite depressing in a way with, not only Indianapolis, the same thing, because we had in Mexico City, we had in the same museum, we had the exhibition eight years ago, and we had it now two months ago. It was, it was a different place. So uh, we, we had a hard time pulling out uh, lighthearted stories, so to say, from our collection to bring them to, to Mexico. So we would not have everyone crying when they leave the museum. So because we we actually want to do this roller coaster of emotions. We don't want to have to just downward spiral of emotions. So uh, 
yeah I, so i don't know if that will if that is uh the case here um um it also depends who who are people who are involved in collecting the stories so if it's if it's students then sometimes you get younger population stories uh if it's a bit older people then of course it, it reflects your surrounding in a way uh, but yeah I, I i'd say it's some really hard hard and powerful stories that we got Alinka, do you want to add anything to that? <laughs> yes, uh, it's been, um, it's always nice when you have uh, uh, people on the other side, the students who worked on the, on the collection of stories in the community and uh, um, Yes, I, I think we've got a kind of a slice of uh, of life here in the student community, uh, couples, and um, yeah, I cannot say it's, you know, what is unique. So, uh, because in many places, uh, things are very universal, but there is this local player and that kind of uh, um, it's great traveling in that way because you come to a place and you don't learn about it through you know tourist guides but you are immediately in the heart of people so it, it's been a, a, a great thing to experience I think it's really interesting that you mentioned the travel connection because I was also thinking you mentioned the other day that you really like to travel and I was thinking about the way that these exhibits become an opportunity for you to create some kind of deeper connection. Yeah, now we're in trouble. We can't travel like just travel. <laughs> <laughs> we feel what are we doing here? <laughs> so you so now you have to do an exhibit if you're going to go to a new place. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that certainly from my perspective, it, I guess that characterizes this exhibition or one prominent feature of the exhibition, we might say, is that major role that students played in cultivating the objects, uh, in creating programs and educational resources, in curating the satellite displays that are around campus and around the, the city, and in talking with you about kind of that initial, how do we make sense of all of, all of these objects and stories that people have so generously donated? What was it like for you to collaborate with students who are training to become museum professionals? Because I know you've collaborated with students before, but this is maybe a little bit of a different type of collaboration. Uh... For us, it was a really great experience because uh, when you are doing a project for, you know, 17 years and you would all the time, we feel that need to open it to, you know, uh, new collaborators, new generations, because it's uh, clear that what it was for us when we started, things have changed. And for us, it was a great opportunity to uh, connect with young people, plus future museum professionals to hear their opinion, their ideas, and we were quite open uh, for their input, and I think uh, it has um, enriched also our experience uh, with this project, and we were quite impressed by the satellite displays they created, the, the ideas they had, uh, how to pull it out, how to set it out to make it more compelling for the for the visitors. So it was really for us a uh, super experience. And I think uh, we'll have more opportunities like this one in the future. Thanks. So 
Um, we are truly delighted that Indianapolis is now a part of your this global conversation. Um, and you two have been around the world. I mean, this takes you everywhere. And like you said earlier, you've borne witness to so many different kinds of broken relationships. Um, and oh, so again, I have two questions. So, but the first one is, um, what, when you reflect on these universals that you mentioned, what an experience for you two, what a journey. What have you learned about love, loss, and growth that you, like, what could you share with us? What, what, what are the things that stand out for you? Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> because when we started, it was never meant to be kind of a didactic project. And uh, um, I don't know. What we have learned is that every experience counts. And uh, uh, I can speak for me that going through all these stories, uh, no matter how painful they might be, uh, I got the feeling that how wonderful it is to be human and to be in this world and to have the opportunity to kind of connect with it, with each other. So this sense of connection is uh, so powerful and so important uh, in our lives. And um, at the same time, I've learned not to take myself too seriously, you know, <laughs> Because you know you you really feel you are a part of a of a bigger picture, and that your um, that your suffering is somehow alleviated with just being the part of uh, of this community. So, um, and that all this is um, you know this is the life experience with all good and bad as it can get but this is the only life we have so and uh, our lives have an end in, in eventually so uh, and people are I, I've learned that people are you know uh, really courageous all around the world and they they have all sorts of way to to you know um, help themselves uh, accept the the reality they do it sometimes with a lot of uh, humor and with a lot of joy sometimes with a laborious process of healing and uh, yeah so that's that's been a really a, an adventure of our lives if I can say and an insight into the human nature and uh, Yes. <laughs> Rajan? Yeah, and how complicated we all are. <laughs> and uh, uneducated in, in the field of love and, and loss. That, that was kind of surprising when you see that uh, people repeat the mistakes they do. And yes. they wonder, like, why is this always happening to me? And, Maybe you should think about that. Maybe it's you, you know. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> and it's uh, yeah. It it was it was. It's it's interesting when you when you're at the museum all the time and you when you see the reactions of visitors. Uh, how often? I love one one of the comments was great. The guy came out and he was like, "Who?" And I thought I had a bad time. You know, like he really genuinely felt like, okay, it could have been much worse. So, but it's, you know, that's, that's this, uh, because it, it's our personal experience. Sometimes we don't want to share it with anyone. Sometimes the culture doesn't uh, uh, encourage the sharing of these things. So you kind of left alone with it. And then you come to a museum and you see, oh, okay. You actually educate yourself through this movies and literature it's fiction it's different this when you see it it's like oh okay so these are real people and this really happened to them so yeah 
That's great. Um, so I think it's really interesting that you compare the stories um, that, that people encounter in the museum, or I guess you contrast it with movies and TV and things that are that are explicitly fiction. But that reminds me of something, Olinka, that I've heard you talk about uh, in presentations that there is an element or a space for fiction in the in the Museum of Broken Relationships, but we just don't necessarily know like what is what is fiction or where the fiction lies. And so I, I don't know, could you just expand on that a, a little bit? Um, I think that the moment we start talking about the past, you, there is no, you know, uh, there is no button you can you can revive the past in the safe mode, and it's going to be exactly as it happened. And the two persons living the same uh, experience can have a different story about it. So I think this. Uh, border between reality and fiction, uh, speaking of us humans, it's really um, very vague. And uh, the moment we start talking about the past, maybe we are uh, creating a story. So, and we get that question quite often. How do you know that the stories are true? Well, I don't know, <laughs> but it's only if the stories are be believable, if they speak to me, if they, are, if I can connect to them, and that experience, it's like a great literature. You connect to to things that you feel can be uh, a part of your life as well, or the worlds you would like to live and experience, but you can't, so you you live them through through fiction and the stories. Yeah. And the and the reality for me might be completely fictional <laughs> to you know yeah. to to my partner or you know or whomever. So sorry, I I've taken us on a tangent, but I yeah was, yeah that's uh... I was moved. So. <laughs> I also wanted to just ask you. You both mentioned that we are really living in challenging times. I mean, I. 17 years across 30 countries, you've seen all kinds of challenging times. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious as we grapple with all sorts of broken relationships mm -hmm. in our lives and in our countries and in our communities, um, is there anything that you've witnessed in the museum or in the objects and stories or in the process that people experience in the museum that inspires your hope for the future? Um. It's, yeah, I don't know. It's so hard. And I don't know if we spoke about it when the, after the first uh, presentation of the museum, the installation of the Museum of Broken Relationships, uh, it was in 2008. We applied uh, with a project that was called uh, Museum of Broken Relationships, Broken Hearts in Broken Territories. And that was just, I mean, it was 10 years after the war uh, ended in ex-Yugoslavia. So we both were there when they when that happened. And we wanted to take the museum to all the ex-republics of Yugoslavia just to uh, collect the stories uh, and see whether uh, the culture we all shared in, in the country that no longer exists would come up in those stories without telling anything to people. And we wanted to see whether the, the war memories will also come out. And that really happened. And it was a great, um, a great experience. And uh, people really connected with the stories coming from Croatia, Bosnia, and... Um, and this is why, like when when we read the news that when the war in Ukraine started, it was such a shock for us because you know <laughs> what it means, and you know that the war is going to end one day. But what um, what expect what you can expect later is like twenty years of trying to heal at least <laughs> and cope with the reality. And that was such a shattering um, experience. 
And when I see the stories in the museum, I really think that people are peaceful and we are really, people are basically nice people. And, uh, but I don't know. So I have to admit, sometimes I really, um, um, it's hard to understand what, what happens in the world and why that happens. But um, yeah, what gives me hope is really what uh, we collect at the museum, the stories of ordinary people like you and me. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Rajan? She's wearing hopeful, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, she chose hopeful. hopeful so. Mine is not that one. <laughs> what he's wearing heartless um yeah it's uh i mean i would hope because i have a 15 year old you know i would hope that it turns out well but uh, I, it just seems like we're never learning from mistakes we just keep repeating them and repeating them and so yeah it's hard to correct the human nature if we were able to learn more about ourselves, to learn more about, you know, emotions, to connect to other people, but yeah, it doesn't even work in small societies. So, so I would I'm add kind that, of hopeless, yeah. But these are some of the things that I think the Museum of Broken Relationships are doing. And yeah, that's all you can do. You can right. try. Yeah. And the stories of resilience are the ones I'll just add, those are the ones that really stand out to me, that there were lots of really difficult stories. But the other thing that I see in the Museum of Broken Relationships is that broken relationships are a part of our lives and that we move on and incorporate those broken relationships into our identities. And maybe I'm more hopeful at this moment, but- Probably learn something from them. Yes, hopefully we, we do learn. So thank you for that contribution. I think Laura's gonna take us now to your questions. Oh, I know you've had all kinds of questions brewing as we've been talking and I really wanna know what your questions are. So if you're, if you're on Zoom, take a minute and put a question into the Q&A and I'll pull it up. But for starters, Let's hear from the room. So yeah, you've got a question right here. Great, yeah, so I can, I can give the factual update. Um, so there are a number of small manifestations of the Museum of Broken Relationships in Indianapolis that students in my curatorial practices class from the fall created. So with the collection um, from the global collection and the objects that were donated from Indianapolis, they basically created small exhibitions of between one and four objects that are now almost all of them are up right now uh, around campus and around town. So if you're looking for more of the Museum of Broken Relationships in Indianapolis, there's a whole list of locations on the exhibit website, but I can tell you there's um, there's one in the on campus, there's one at University Library in the walkway that connects it with the School of Education and Social Work buildings. There is another installation on the fourth floor of Kavanaugh Hall outside of the Museum Studies Program Office. There's an installation in the Campus Center, and there's another installation in the Ruth Lilly Law Library at the Law School just up New York Street. Don't then, give up all the locations. Let don't tell all the locations? Yeah. Okay. So you'll have, <laughs> there's a map in, in the gallery. <laughs> you, can, you can find the locations, but I will also tell you, um, We've got uh, locations off, off campus at some community spaces, community centers, and there will be a, another exhibit opening in March. Um, can I tell them where the, <laughs> at the Central Library downtown? Yeah. Other questions? Yes.
Uh, there are two groups, so to say. So first, they just want to kind of move this from them and uh, relieve themselves from being reminded by existence of this object in the drawer or wherever. Um, but then during time, I guess, uh, people are starting to take the Museum of Broken Relationships more seriously. Uh, so now most, a lot of these objects are sort of stories that are immortalizing the biggest love they had. So when you get somebody who's 75 year old and he's sending you an object from the 70s, uh, it was, it was, he realized at that moment or she, that that was something that uh, they want to share with the world and they want to share their love story with the world. Although it didn't work out. I mean, often, I often refer to our museum as a museum about love, just upside down. It's, uh, and that's really how I feel about it. Uh, having the, every love will end eventually. That's the law of nature. So we just show it when it's over. So before I take the next question from the audience, I just want to apologize to those of you on Zoom. It looks like I got logged out of the call. So I'm seeing fragments of some messages, but not the whole messages. So if you put a question in the chat before, please put it back so I can bring it into the conversation here. Okay, I saw some hands in the back toward the end. Here, um, I'm loud. Okay. Okay. Um, could you share a particular object that you've seen um, donated at some point in the 17 years you've been doing this and why it resonated with you? <laughs> I don't know. For me, uh, let's say the the some of the most powerful objects are those when I witnessed the moment where when they were donated. And uh, I don't know if I told this story already. Uh, so it's um, uh, it's a Uno game, like a box of uh, cards, Uno game. And I, I remember uh, the person who donated it at the museum in Zagreb after completing the visit. He just took this, uh, he had a camera and a bag for the camera. And from that bag, he just took this Uno game and put it on the counter and later on filled in the story. And I witnessed that moment. And after that, I read the whole story, which was a impossible love between two soldiers in Afghanistan. He was an American soldier and she was uh, an Australian um, field nurse, I think. And then uh, after that experience, they he wanted to reconnect and get together with her. And then the story goes that he, that she was kind of always finding an excuse why he couldn't come to, to Australia to connect with her. And he bought the game of Uno and traveled the whole Southeast Asia waiting for, for this moment to come and which never came. And then he ends his story saying, okay, this is the most uh, traveled game of Uno in the world. And I think this is the place where it has to end uh, its journey. So it was quite, uh, quite a powerful object for me. <laughs> So we've got a question from somebody on Zoom who is intrigued. I, I think they've perhaps been to some of your other exhibitions and exhibition spaces because they've noted that the um, often when you open the exhibit, you provide a quote by Roland Barth and by a quote by Roland Barth. Uh, and so they are wondering who are some of your other theoretical influences when you when doing this process of creating and interpreting exhibitions? Uh, well, I think different influences, it's, uh, 
uh, I never was inspired specifically for the exhibition. So Roland Barth wrote this uh, uh, text, uh, Lover's Discourse, which was something I read when I was a student uh, of French, and that really stayed with me. And uh, when this idea about the museum came to my mind, that that quote was already in my head. When we started the, the project, uh, I've just seen the film, I think we both saw it, uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And that was uh, also a beautiful story where the person tries to erase the memory of the relationship, but that permanent erasure doesn't work. And that was like a trigger to also uh, imagine the museum. Then I also now on the wall of the museum in Zagreb, there is a quote by um, a scholar from California of, uh, I think, Palestine and origin, Jalal Tufik, and he has an essay which is called Undying Love or Love Dies, which was also an inspiration, but many different things. Trajan read, uh, uh, you are a fan of scientific uh, stuff about love, you know, how do uh, biology and uh, evolution explain our, uh, our behavior? So many, many different uh, sources. I don't know. I can. I also today we went to Iron York Museum, and I kind of took a picture uh, of a of a quote there, introducing um, portion of the museum speaking about relation, a shared world, and it kind of resonated immediately with me and the museum. And they say the theme of relation re explores the connections native peoples have to places, people, and beliefs. Um, it is the way in which native peoples associate with the world around them, big and small, and these connections are not limited to linear time. Uh, by leading artistic lives, native peoples maintain their connection to spirit, place, animals, plants, and each other. And I thought that was something in the line of a museum. So I took a picture just to <laughs> inspire myself for. So the, the inspiration keeps coming. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Let's see. Yes, in the middle. Well, first of all, thank you so much. And I do appreciate such a great deep idea, which is related to humanity and like one of the deepest experiences that probably all of us have had. So I do appreciate that. Um, which part was, which is like very, very like impressive to me is the part that you talked about war and the experience that you had before and how like people participated to share their, you know, their broken hearts, which was cause of like, you know, loss through war or something. So could you please just tell me how was the experiences of the audiences who never had an experience of losing someone from a, you know, a crisis like more more like something like a war something you know like a more human crisis so like some people have like when you talk about broken hearts in relationship everyone can just you know find something I guess in themselves and they can just feel the empathy but about the human crisis it's really hard to I do believe that we are billions of beautiful broken hearts but when we are talking about a human crisis, it's really hard to imagine how it could be to lose someone in war or to lose someone because of a something racism. You know, like even for the people who are living in another space, it might be very like, although they have that humanity in themselves, but it's it's hard to feel like, how does it 
make you feel if you lose someone in a mass shooting. This you know is what a I'm saying? Great point. So yeah. So how do we how do we think about these relationships that are broken through yeah. other means that maybe everybody doesn't get to doesn't yeah. doesn't experience? And excuse me, before you continue, because I want to close it. Um, and the second one is gonna be: Do you think that like you can use the same way to aware empathy and consciousness, maybe towards the human crisis in the world and just, you know, make the people be united to, to take actions by feeling more empathy about the things that they don't have experience, but, you know, it's part of it. Thank you. Um, I'll start from the second one. Unfortunately, we cannot, because that's what I said. We don't learn from our mistakes. And we who have been through war, uh, we've seen it. It will never happen again as long as we live there because nobody will want to repeat this. Unfortunately, on the other side of the border, somewhere else, people didn't go through the war. It might happen again. Uh, the thing with, to your first question, uh, the thing with museum, we, we, you could look at it as a layered thing. So, there are stories for everyone. Uh, you may not connect to the experience that you have not been through. But uh, losing someone, for example, through suicide, we had uh, we had a really uh, we were in Melbourne in Australia, and uh, a lady come over. And she just wanted to thank us for um, the exhibition uh, because she lost a, a daughter. And Yeah, but actually just just seeing the exhibition helped her a lot and she just wanted to thank us. So yeah, it's meant for different kinds of experiences and you will connect to some of these. They don't. I they maybe they do, maybe they don't, you know, but it's it, it this is a thing when you have five people going you, you just talked about this today that you had your students write what and you have like 20 students and there were 20 stories none of them repeated it has to do with your personal experience and you will connect to something somebody else will connect to something else i would say that you know in the museum like losing someone to death and to war and kind of seeing seeing that story and the object in the museum you really con I, I think people connect and for example i remember one of our first exhibitions in singapore where people didn't know anything about you know the war in yugoslavia we had some objects referring to that and that really sparked the interest of the audience they wanted to know more they wanted to know what happened because the the stories that were there were stories from people everyone could connect to you know a story uh, of a 12 year old boy who was leaving uh sarajevo under siege and fell in love with a girl who was on an, another truck uh, a teenage love, but they wanted to know more about the uh, about the situation. They wanted to connect and to understand what what happened because this individual emotional level allows you to connect, even though you might not know all the political uh, social circumstances, but you connect on that level because you know what it means to lose something and someone you cherish in any way, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> so we've got time for one more question and I'm going to bring in a question from um, the, Zoom, the Zoom list. Someone 
is is wondering. So you've got all you've got all of these anonymously donated objects in your collection. Have you ever encountered somebody coming into the museum and recognizing an object that was not the one that they donated? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it was it was the opening in Sarajevo, and it was since you know Croatia is quite a small country and Zagreb is just a million people and everybody knows each other and we we received the bicycle uh and we knew the girl that, that gave us the bicycle and it was like you go into the gallery and it's on the wall right here and we were in the courtyard there was the opening so you know the drinks were outside and everything and i see her ex-boyfriend who was there because there's a film festival like he walking in cheerfully like hi guys you know walks in and just walks out right <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it happened and i know it happened some other times as well yeah oh. An interesting story connect to the video you will see uh, at the exhibition here. Um, so this is a story. I won't tell you what it, it's about. It's just that uh, it was donated in Slovenia in Maribor, and it's a story dating to the Second World War. And uh, it's one of the... Um, so it's not an object. It's a small film we made with uh, with a contributor uh, who didn't want to part with the original letters and photographs she had. So we proposed to kind of film her. So it's the only face you see uh, among all those objects. And uh, I think Drajan was at the museum when there was this young couple from Serbia visiting and they asked us whether uh, we know the, yeah, whether we know the the donators' contacts and because they would like to get in contact and we asked who was it about because the guy recognized, you will see in the video, on the pictures, his grandfather. And he said, I think that's my grandfather. And they we then we tried to put them in contact, and that was such a you don't expect it to happen. And uh, uh, he didn't know about the, the that part of the life of his grandfather, so he kind of. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 and uh, and uh, when we filmed the the video we sent the dvd to this lady and she kind of sent us christmas cards every christmas and said and thanked us because for the first time she told the story to her children and grandchildren and she just showed them the the film so that was a really nice story wow <laughs> wow what a story to end on too because what I think what's especially beautiful about that is all the different layers of connection that emerged out of somebody sharing their story of a broken relationship with with you and and with the with the museum. Wow. Okay, that's gonna stick. That's gonna stick with me. Thank you, everybody, for your fabulous questions from the room from Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Olinka and Drajan and Lois. I'll hand the microphone back to you. Thank you, Laura. So thank you so much for all the wonderful questions and your deep engagement. This is obviously a project that stimulates great connections and conversation. And we want to thank you for being here with us, both in person and online. Um, and I just want to say that we at IUPUI simply could not be any prouder or more grateful to have you here with us for all that you have done in this these short few days, but since last fall and sharing your generous hearts and your wisdom and your creativity with all of us here and the students. So thank you so much. Please join me in another round of applause for our esteemed visionaries. And before we before we close and move out to visit the galleries and enjoy some refreshments, just a couple words of special thanks. Um, 
I want to give a shout out to the Museum of Broken Relationships Collections Manager, um, Charlotte Fuentes. Uh, she's probably not watching right now because it's uh, 2 a.m. in Zagreb, but she was amazing and worked very closely with you guys and with the students, and we appreciate that. We also want to thank Dean Greg Hull, Dean Tammy Idol, the support of the Office of Student um, Service and Learning, and especially to Paula Katz and the amazing staff of the Heron Galleries, and to my colleague, Laura Holzman, for joining me on this amazing journey. Um, thank you. And my last shout out goes to all of our students in the Museum Studies Program, and a special shout out to our three community engagement associates, who I hope that you will connect with this evening, Marissa Hamm, Emily McMath, and Shelby Riley. Thank you everybody for all that you have done to make this project possible. So now after all this sitting, we invite you to um, please check out the galleries, enjoy some refreshments, and if you would like to join in the reception uh, that is in memory of Heron Professor Ian Fraser, please head to the Basile Gallery. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>